Welcome to Unwired Learning. In this video, we're going to take a look at a transistor amplifier circuit, and we're going to try to solve it using this small signal model. Before we can do that, though, we must describe the process of using the small signal equivalent models in the case of a transistor amplifier circuit. We'll be discussing a few of the rules associated with transitioning the circuit into the small signal model equivalent. And after that, we're going to look at our basic amplifier circuit, and we're going to try to solve it. Using the small signal equivalent models is a four-step process. The first step in the process is a familiar one. The goal here is to use DC analysis techniques to determine the operating point of the transistor and use that operating point information to calculate the small signal equivalent circuit parameters. However, one of the things that we're going to find is in real amplifier circuits, we oftentimes have capacitors and we have our small signals. So what do we do with those small signal sources, and what do we do with capacitors? Well, easy enough for the small signal sources. We just eliminate them. When it comes to the capacitors, what we're going to do is we're going to think of them as being open circuits in DC. And that does it for step one. So what about step two? Step two is all about getting our circuit ready to implement the small signal equivalent model. Again, what we need to do is reconsider the idea of the DC sources as well as any of the capacitors in the circuit, in the original circuit. So for step two, when it comes to DC sources, we're gonna short DC voltage sources. And if we do happen to have any DC current sources, they'll be replaced with an open circuit. When it comes to capacitors in step two, we will consider them to be sufficient for whatever frequency our amplifier is operating at, and therefore they will become a short circuit. Once we've accomplished all these steps in step number two, we can move on to step number three. Step number three is a simple one. All we're gonna do is we're gonna replace the transistor with one of the small signal equivalent models. In most cases, it's worth trying the hybrid Pi model first, and if for some reason the circuit analysis of that model is difficult, then you can move on to the T model. As you gain more experience, you'll start to understand which types of circuits are easier to solve with the T model than they are with the hybrid Pi. Step number four then is all about analyzing the new circuit. And all you're gonna do there is use your circuit theory techniques to find things like the input resistance, output resistance, and the voltage gain. Now that we have a sense of how to use these amplifier circuit models, let's go ahead and try out a circuit. In this video, we're gonna look at a MOSFET circuit example. In this case, we're asked to find the gain of the circuit V out over V in, the input resistance R in, and the max voltage input that is allowed to maintain saturation mode. We have a 15 volt power supply, we have a 15 kilo ohm drain resistor, and we have a bit of a different type of biasing circuit that we have not seen yet that is a feedback resistor that we'll call R sub G, and that feedback resistor provides a DC voltage here at the gate, thus biasing this transistor. We also have, as mentioned before, a couple of capacitors. We call these coupling capacitors that couple the voltage input signal with the DC circuit. And we have a coupling capacitor here at the output that couples to our load resistor of 5 kilo ohms. We have a few parameters here given about the transistor. The Kn value is 0.25 milliamps per volt squared, our threshold voltage of 1.5 volts, and we have an early voltage given to us of 50 volts. Following our steps here, we know that our first step is to look at the DC analysis of this circuit. The goal in doing the DC analysis is to find our small signal parameters. So let's look at this circuit and figure out what's the first thing that we need to do in order to start solving the DC analysis. Well, one of the things I always like to remember about a MOSFET is that the gate current is zero. Practically what that means is that the voltage at the drain is equal to the voltage at the gate, and we can write an equation for the voltage at the drain and gate of VDD minus IDRD. Looking at this, if the voltage here at the drain is equal to the voltage here at the gate, as we had just surmised, then what we can say is that this circuit is definitely in saturation. How do we know that? Well, no matter what voltage we have here, if it's the same as the voltage here at the gate, we know that what turns on this transistor and also indicates that we're in saturation mode is that the overvoltage, or VG minus the threshold voltage, must be smaller than the voltage here at the drain. Well, that's always going to be the case for any value of VT larger than zero which in our situation is the case. So therefore, we know that the circuit is in saturation. 
Knowing that, we can write down our saturation equation. We can say ID equals 1 half Kn Vg minus Vs minus the threshold voltage Vt quantity squared. Well, in this circuit, the source is grounded, so we know that Vs equals zero. Knowing that and substituting our newfound equation for Vg, we can find that ID equals 1 half Kn Vdd minus IDRD minus Vt quantity squared. Now's a good time to go ahead and substitute our parameter values, which makes ID equal to 1 half times 1 fourth times the quantity of 15 minus 15 ID minus 1.5 volts quantity squared. Moving the 1 half and 1 fourth over, we can say that 8 ID equals 15 volts minus 15 ID minus 1.5 volts quantity squared. Combining the 15 volts and 1.5 volts, we can now say that 8 ID equals minus 15 ID plus 13 and a half quantity squared. Expanding this out and moving the 8 ID over from the left to the right, we can find that 0 equals 225 ID squared minus 413 ID plus 182 and a quarter. Using a solver, we can find two different values for ID. The first value is 0 0.74 milliamps and the second value 1.1 milliamps. Knowing that our drain resistor is a 15 kilo ohm resistor and we have a 15 volt supply, multiplying 15 by 1.1 milliamps would obviously be larger than 15 volts. Therefore, we can conclude that the correct current is 0.74 milliamps. Now that we've found the correct current of 0.74 milliamps, we can start the process of finding a few of the voltages in this circuit, which will help us to find the small signal parameters. Let's start with the voltage at the drain and gate. Plugging into the previous equation that we found, we can now say that VD equals VG equals 15 minus 15 times 0.74, which equals 3.93 volts. Since the source is grounded, and if we know that VD equals VG, we can now find the overvoltage. Overvoltage will be given as 3.93 volts minus 1.5 volts, which equals 2.43 volts. And with that, we ought to now be able to find our small signal parameters. Let's start with the value GM. We know that GM equals KN VOV. In this case, KN is a quarter, and VOV we just found as 2.43 volts. Therefore, GM equals 0.607 milliamps per volt. In this circuit, we were given that we have an early voltage of 50 volts. Therefore, we have an output resistance in this circuit, and we must calculate that small signal parameter. From a previous analysis, we know that R out equals VA over ID. Well, VA is 50 volts, and ID is 0.74 milliamps, which results in an RO of 67.75 kilo ohms. Now that we have our two small signal parameters, we can move on to creating the equivalent circuit. In step two, we were told that DC sources, such as this 15 volt source, well, a DC voltage source gets shorted down to ground. And what we do is we substitute the small signal equivalent model for our transistor. In this case, as mentioned, we're going to go ahead and try the hybrid Pi model. Let's go ahead and start with just drawing the hybrid Pi model, and then we'll figure out the rest from there. Okay, now that we have our hybrid Pi model drawn, let's look at the rest of the connections. We can see here that right here at the drain, we have this 15 kilo ohm resistor. And because this DC source is shorted down to ground, this appears to go from drain down to ground. Since our capacitors act as shorts in this small signal equivalent, we can also see that our load resistor goes from the drain all the way down to ground. In this circuit, our source is also grounded, and here at the gate, we have our input voltage signal. The only thing left here is our RG resistor. We can see that that is connected from gate up to drain. And this circuit over here is now our small signal equivalent model for this transistor amplifier. Let's go ahead and proceed to solving this circuit using our circuit theory techniques. Let's start with recognizing that all three of these resistors, the RO, RD, and RL, are all in parallel. We'll give that a name of RL prime to indicate an equivalent resistance. And RL prime is RO in parallel with RD in parallel with RL. Plugging in our values for RO, RD, and RL, and solving the parallel configuration, we find that that equivalent resistance is 3.55 kilo ohms. Now that we have that, we can actually redraw our circuit in a little bit more simple configuration. And like magic, 
there it is. Now that we're looking at this circuit, let's go ahead and take a look at the various currents in this circuit. Here we have a current that we'll call our input current, I sub I. After this dependent current source, we know that the current in this node will be equal to I sub I minus the current from the source, GM VGS. We'll call that current I sub out. Now that we have an expression for I sub out, we can use that to find the voltage V out across the equivalent load resistance. Using Ohm's law, we can say that V out equals I out times RL prime. Plugging in for I out, we can say that that equals quantity of I sub I minus GM VI times RL prime. Now what about this current I sub I? Can we come up with an expression for that current? Sure. All we have to do is recognize that we have a node voltage over here, VI. We have a node voltage out here, V out. And we have this resistor, RG. Using Ohm's law again, we can say that I sub I equals VI minus V out divided by RG. Now we're going to plug in this value of I sub I into our previous equation. Doing that results in an expression of V out equals quantity of VI minus V out divided by RG minus GMVI times RL prime. Distributing the RL prime into the quantity, we can find that VI minus V out times RL prime over RG minus GMVI RL prime. Looking at this and looking at our circuit, we know that RL prime, well, that's about 3.55 kilo ohms. And RG, that's in the mega ohm range. In this case, 10 mega ohms. Therefore, we can say that this ratio is nearly zero. That results in a rather simple expression for V out, which equals minus GM RL prime times VGS. Well, in this case, we know that VGS is actually also equal to VI. Substituting that in, we get that V out equals minus GM RL prime times VI. Moving the VI over from the right to the left, we can find the gain equation. We can say that AV equals V out over VI equals minus GM RL prime. Substituting our values for GM and RL prime, we can find that our gain is minus 2.16 volts per volt. Well, that's one of the things we needed to accomplish in this problem. All we have left is finding our input resistance and our maximum value of the input voltage. Let's start with the input resistance. Input resistance can be defined as the input voltage divided by the input current. In this case, we actually already have an expression for our input current. So we can say that this equals VI divided by VI minus V out, that divided by RG. But I'm gonna go ahead and move the RG up to the top. Substituting in our previous expression for V out, we can now write this as equal to RG times VI divided by VI plus GM RL prime times VI. Here we can see that we have a VI in all of the terms, the numerator and the two denominator terms, and therefore each of those VIs will cancel. This results in an expression of RN equals RG over one plus GM RL prime. Substituting our values for RG and RL prime and GM, we find that this equals 3.17 mega ohms. Two solutions accomplished and one to go. This last thing that we need to find is what value of the input voltage we need in order to maintain saturation. In other words, what is our maximum input voltage peak value? Once again, we know that in order to find this, we must maintain saturation. We know that our inequality relationship for saturation is VDS is greater than or equal to VGS minus VT. You might notice that I wrote these as our mixed signals. In this case, I did that because we have our DC portion and we have our time varying signal. However, in this case, we also know that our DC values of VD, which in this case is also the same as VDS, is also equal to VGS. And we can write this as our small signal equations only. So we can say that little VDS is greater than or equal to little VGS minus VT. Looking back up here at our equivalent circuit, we might recognize that VDS is equal to our V out. Therefore, we can use our gain equation that we have, and we can substitute that in for what is VDS. Using that, we know that VDS equals 
minus the gain times VGS, which is our input. Plugging that in and substituting the VN or VI for VGS, we can write that minus the absolute value of AV times VI must be equal to VI minus VT. You might be wondering why I went from an inequality relationship to an equality relationship. Well, I did that because I know that at the limit, right at the edge of saturation, this equation will be equal. And that will help us to find the maximum value of VI that's allowed. So in this case, all I need to do is rearrange this and isolate VI. Doing that, I find that VI equals the threshold voltage VT divided by 1 plus the absolute value of AV. Substituting our values in for VT of 1.5 volts, and AV of 2.16 volts per volt, I find that we have a maximum input voltage of 0.475 volts. Well, that was a long one, folks, but that concludes this video of Unwired Learning.